see, I got the thing is with me, you dig. I, I need to know some more about it. I wish you had some more literature about the educational thing here. Because you dig, as far as we concern, the struggle, the way we look at struggle, is that uh, this depends on the educational thing, you dig. No, no, this depends on the education. It's about the whole thing. No, but in this, you can form this with no education. You can uh, this, this. No, not the way we talk about forming it. You know, right. We're talking about forming it. Right. You know, it's not on the paper. We didn't write it on the paper. Forming right with no education. No. Let me give you an example. Uh, you, you, you're your more Kenyatta formed the excellent revolution with no education. And on the day to the end, you're more told the motherfucker. I said, well, uh, you know, you've been educated to uh, 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 hate the enemy, but uh, I'm your brother. I let him lead the revolution. Now I'm more precious. Another example, Papa Dr. Haiti. Papa Dr. Haiti hated everything white. Man, you couldn't put your white paper in front of Papa Dr. Haiti. Yeah. He moved all the white people out and he took over and be a person. Yeah, because no education. And the people that have been educated, they just said that we don't hate the motherfucker uh, white people. We hate the oppressor, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. We got to know your educational program to find out what it's going to be in the fanatic. A lot of people right. work. Your most Kenyatta is called not a never revolutionary, but an ex revolutionary. So it's Papa Dr. They brought on some special revolution. That thing in under my mind was a bit. Back to the freedom fighters, all that kind of action. What we're saying is, is the end. But you don't judge Castro now. You can't do it. Nobody in this room can judge whether Castro is going to be a revolutionary or not. Uh, you know what I mean? We're talking about things, you know what I mean, uh, with uh, China, the People's Republic, and even at the same day in mind, talking about even going on further into a communistic state. That's what we're talking about. That would be revolutionary. But we got to understand here the educational program that you have to be able to figure out whether it will go on the right lines where the people will end up in a situation where they can be able to really control themselves. You understand know what I'm saying? Uh, with no education, the people to take this local foundation and start stealing money because they won't be really educated to why it's a people thing anyway. You understand know what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo colonialism instead of colonialism, like you got in uh, Africa now, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be uh, an educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we're so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before we can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run out ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have education, then they know where. They don't stand. They know where. Because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. You, see, you might get people caught up in the emotionalist movement. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You might get them caught up in because they're poor and they want something. And then if they're not educated, they want more. And before you know it, they'll be Catholics. And before you know it, we'll have Negro impurity. Awesome. So I Imper hope. Uh, imperialists, not appearances, <laughs> in, in the way it was translated. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, that's kind of uh, apt for many things. You know, for one, obviously, this is um, a presentation or a panel put on by. DSA is the National Political Education Committee, and um, you know the the topic will revolve around uh, imperialism. And you know, with the current events, I think that it's a very timely situation. So we are going to start. Uh, it's now eight oh nine. So let us begin. Um, it's August. Uh, 22nd, 2024, sorry for the monologue, everyone, but uh, and it's been 320 days since the events of October 7th. In just a couple of hours from now, Kamala Harris will be giving her speech at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, accepting the presidential nomination for the Democratic Party. With speaker after speaker trying desperately to get the public to believe that the administration that could end the genocide with a phone call is unable to end it, but is tirelessly trying to. Despite hearing from the families of Israeli hostages, no Palestinians have been allowed to speak. During the last phase of the Palestinian struggle for liberation, it is under the Biden-Harris administration that conservatively 40,000 Palestinians have been killed, with some estimates reaching as high as 200,000 murdered men, women, and children. Countless others have been injured. Large swaths of Gaza have been turned into rubble using American-made weapons and with the full backing and support of our government. The destruction will take decades to recover from. Protests have violently, sorry, violently struggled across the nation with encampments rising in prominence uh, across college campuses throughout the country. It is the student movement today and the student movement of yesteryear that we will be talking about tonight. We have brought uh, here tonight three comrades whose experience across generations and social movements to talk about how student organizers have helped shape left resistance to imperialism and racism. 
Um, so we're going to do just a quick introduction before we go into a little bit longer uh, monologues uh, from each of our panelists. Um, we're then going to have a back and forth between everyone uh, just to kind of talk about their similarities and experiences and differences. And then we'll have um, a Q&A session for people in our audience. So feel free to put uh, questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so Carl, do you want to do a quick introduction? My name is Carl Davidson. Uh, for the what's appropriate for this discussion, I was the um, uh, top leader of uh, SDS from 1966 to 1968, in uh, when we had a, about 100,000 members. Um, I started in uh, SDS. Uh, and uh, when I was a young student at Penn State University, and uh, I continued uh, through the end of the organization. After that, I went to work as a revolutionary journalist on the National Guardian, which was a independent left magazine, which was absolutely critical uh, newspaper for the anti-war movement of the time. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Anand? Yeah, my, I'm Anand Pillay. I'm currently working at Notre Dame University in uh, mathematics, work in mathematics. I'm from England originally. My my parents came from South Africa in 1948 for different reasons, including including uh, their marriage being illegal and various other things. And they founded the anti-apartheid movement in England in, around, in the late 50s. I was not really in... I was in, involved just in sort of uh, rally, go, go to demonstrations. I was also involved in anti-racist work of various kinds. I came to the US, to Notre Dame originally in, in 1983, and in the 80s uh, helped Peter Walsh organize the divestment movement in Notre Dame to divest from South Africa, you know, which was not actually set. I'll talk about this later. It wasn't successful, but that, that was my my organizational activity was maybe mainly around that movement. Awesome. Thank you. And finally, Nat. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, Nat from the Tahrir Coalition, as well as YDSA at the University of Michigan, specifically the Ann Arbor campus. Um, kind of my short intro. Um, I uh, joined YDSA in 2021 and now am technically a co-chair, I believe. Um, <laughs> I also do comms for YDSA as well as Tahrir. Um, and within the last year almost, um, I've done everything from comms work to being on jail support as well as actually being involved in civil disobedience. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so now we're going to get into, um, basically, we're going to give our panelists about 10 minutes to talk about their experiences, 10 minutes each to talk about their experiences with the movement um, and their thoughts and reflections on it. So, Carl, take it away. Uh, thank you. Um, early on, the things that interested us most that we got a student movement beginning was uh, the Cuba Missile Crisis. It was uh, my very first demonstration that I ever went to, and there was only a handful of us, and all the other uh, students came down to hoot and holler at us and throw red paint at us. As we were carrying signs, uh, hands off Cuba, and we were extremely worried in those eight days about the danger of nuclear war. We were also shaped at the same time by the upsurge in the beginning upsurge of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the student movement in the South and the civil rights battles. And uh, we also uh, began organizing around that. And uh, I, at the same time, then I, I had a young John Lewis stay in my apartment. And he was wearing his snick bib overalls, and he had come up from the South uh, to raise money to support his uh, projects in the South. I was at Penn State University, which was a quite large campus. And Vietnam at that point was only a um, a small but developing 
topic of interest. I remember following it, and I said, we have to learn more about this. And I remember writing off my peace group. I remember writing off to different places to get pamphlets on Vietnam so people could learn about it and what it was, why it was important, what the Geneva Accords were all about. And in this whole early period, one of the things that really left a mark was in April 17, 1965, SDS decided to have a national March on Washington sponsored by SDS. The reason it became to be sponsored by SDS is that there was strong anti-communism at the time, and if there was no single coalition that could pull together because one side would always want to exclude the communists from taking part in it. So finally, SCS said, screw all you guys, we're going to sponsor it, and everybody is welcome. No, whether you're a communist or a socialist or a Democrat or whatever, everybody against the war is welcome to come. We expected about 5,000 people to show up. So uh, I went down to Washington, and lo and behold, 25,000 people showed up. And we were amazed. And I remember when we took the bus back to State College, and the next morning I ran down to get to uh, Sunday New York Times because I was, I was certain that LBJ, in response to our demonstration, were, uh, you know, was going to you know, uh, uh, call off the war. That shows how naive we were at the time. We thought that the moment well, that was going to bring an end to the war. Far from it. So what we continued to do in this period was that we still had basically what we called educational work to do. And these grew into what was then called the teaching movement, where we got together with faculty and other people who knew things about Vietnam. And we organized these mass teachings. Some of them went on for days at different campuses, and this spread all over the campuses all over the country where we were basically doing educational work, educating how the U.S. was in violation of Geneva Accords, what the history of Vietnam, and what did it all mean, and so on. We understood that there was, uh, as the war escalated, there were more and more people, uh, young uh, Americans were going to be drafted into this war and uh, kill and be killed. So that uh, entered into it as well. Well, that was probably the whole early period. Once the war continued uh, to escalate and it became clearer and clearer that it wasn't ending, it began to radicalize us. And so the next phase was uh, what I call the, the second period. It's where the, we students uh, began to look at our universities and investigate them for all of their connections with the war machinery. And not only the fact that uh, uh, recruiters like the CIA or Dow Chemical would come on campus, but embedded in the actual institutions of the university itself were uh, anthropology departments studying peasant societies in Vietnam and how best to develop counterinsurgency programs or at Columbia University, the Institute for Defense Analysis, helping to de develop nuclear weapons and so on. There were hundreds of things, these institutions that we discovered that existed, pro-war institutions that were embedded in, in our universities. So this was a, what is now called the divestment movement uh, 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 started here. And... Uh, we didn't call it the divestment movement. We just, you know, we called it institutional resistance, and we began organizing uh, demonstrations and sit-ins and strikes on our campuses uh, to get these off of our campuses. And one of the bigger ones was uh, the first huge battle at Columbia University, where the Columbia University went on strike to get rid of the IDA, the Institute for Defense Analysis, and uh, Columbia was also expanding into the black community. So they united with the African-American students there. 
and uh, and also against the police attacks on the students. Those were the, the three big issues that we, we fought around in the Columbia strike. Uh, and then once the Columbia strike took on it, we put out this uh, SD, I was a sort of, I, in SDS, I, by this time I had been uh, moved in, I was a national officer of SDS. And uh, I was given a, you know, uh, an old Cadillac hearse and boxes of literature and Viet Cong films. And I just, for uh, two years, I traveled to maybe a hundred and different, 150 different campuses, one after another. If you've ever heard of the noted outside agitator, that was me. Uh, I was uh, in every one of those battles from the Berkeley student strikes to the Columbia strikes to Wisconsin. So I traveled to every campus. So I got to see them up close and organize around them and agitate and try to take lessons from one battle to the other. And at the same time, work up a kind of theoretical analysis of the multiversity and try to make sense of all of this. So it was basically a very intense refocusing of the energy of the student movement back onto the campuses and and trying to break up and uh, and fight the war machine in in uh, this way. In 1968, we went into a third period, which was uh, quite different. And I think if you look at the year 1968 and how remarkable it became, and at the very beginning, the first office started off with the Tet Offensive in January, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, a huge surge that just blew away all the ideas that the U.S. was winning the war. In February, the French uh, student strike, soon to be followed by the French workers following the students. And, uh, a month and a half later, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and the huge upsurges and revolts in all of the cities, 100 cities in the United States had a black revolt. Bobby Kennedy shot and murdered a few months later. So in 1968, the world was on fire and we were in the thick of it. And, and I remember when I heard, uh, we were driving back to Chicago when I heard the King was shot. First thing we did was we got on the streets uh, we organized teams of young white kids to go on the streets, and uh, we uh, talked. The, the tanks were you know, there was a tank in front of our office, and there, the National Guard had brought in. The National Guard were all young kids like us. They would, had gone into the National Guard, so I wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. So we spent the whole night walking, talking to them on their trucks, on their tanks. We would say, "Don't kill for the slumlords. Take your." If you have to shoot, shoot up in the air, but don't kill for the slumlord. So we made it our business. That was the way that we could think that we could express some solidarity with the revolts that were going on. We talked to the GIs that had been, the National Guard that had been sent in and tried to uh, convince them not to turn their guns on the African-American communities. Well, that was a, a huge uh, change in our conditions. At the same time, the Vietnamese had gotten to the point where they had won enough victories that they began to negotiate at the same time. And, uh, and the mass demonstrations, the huge mobilizations became larger and larger, a quarter of a million, half a million, and even more. And then they we would have one in Washington. We had spring and fall offenses. They would go back and forth uh, all over the country. And we began to argue about what was the best way that we could render assistance to the Vietnam. How could we help Vietnam win? That was a question that was on our minds at the time. One, uh, and two very different answers. One thing that started one faction of SCS began to be influenced by Raji Debray's Foco theory and the idea that we had to start they, they had a slogan, bring the war home, and they wanted to start armed struggle, a uh, guerrilla warfare at home, um, waging, uh, blowing up uh, any military installations and things like that. And there were others of us who thought that that was a bunch of nonsense and that we had to be organizing among the GIs and the 
at the different military bases uh, the stuff that Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda had been organizing. We had to be working with the Vietnam veterans against the war, organizing larger and larger demonstrations. So at one point, uh, we were uh, invited all down to Cuba, where we sat down for two weeks in an old uh, seminary. Uh, one third of the people were Cubans, one third of us were young SDSers, and the others were uh, revolutionaries from Vietnam, including a general from North Vietnam and other fighters from the National Liberation Front in the South. And uh, we uh, tried to educate each other on our different struggles and, and bring out the different debates and so on. I think the debate erupted there between the the, uh, the what later on became the Weather Underground. They wanted the Cubans to train them in weapons. The Cubans told them, if you wanted training in weapons, go to the best trainer of all, join the U.S. Army, and get your training. Don't come down here asking us to do it for you. I had a good discussion with uh, one uh, older uh, Vietnamese general from the North Vietnam about some of this stuff. And I asked him bluntly, I said, what do you need from us most? And he said, what we need from you most is huge mass demonstrations that every grandmother can bring a baby carriage to around the demand out now and set the date for withdrawal. That's what we need more than anything else. So some of us paid attention to that and took it to heart. And obviously others didn't. And that set the stage for the uh, the split uh, that developed in SDS. And the organization was later unable to really continue into what were some of the hugest demonstrations that followed after Nixon's invasion of Cambodia and the killing of the students at Kent State. There, we had the biggest upsurge of all 5 million out of 8 million college students in the entire country shut down the entire university system. I, I was working as a guardian at the time. I got phone calls one after another. I just spent the whole, whole days on the subway going from one campus to the next, speaking to 10,000 here, 20,000 there. Carl, and sorry, so do you mind uh, just... I am rounding it up. That's the yes, end sir. of it. So I'll leave it at that. That's where it ended. And uh, eventually, in 1975, after more than a decade, the war came to an end. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And sorry for cutting you off. I mean, I know uh, all of you could go on for hours and hours because it's very fascinating subjects. Um, uh, Anand, uh, you're up next. Okay, yeah. Well, I want to say thanks to Carl for this amazing story of the uh, of the movement in America, which uh, I knew, you know, I knew of the SDS is it PL PL split through some friends I had in Oxford who was actually in PL, but I didn't know the details of the connection with with these meetings in Cuba. So it's really fantastic story, fantastic story to, to know these things. So I'm 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 going to say I'm going to be a less a little bit less hands on than Carl and uh, uh, in terms of so I was not really involved in this level of organisation as a teenager in England I was we had this Grosvenor Square demonstration against the Vietnam War with battling with the police which I was in, as, there as a teenager involved in various anti racist activity including. Defending, defending people against attacks by the fascists in Manchester. In before I came to America, I came to America. I came to North America in eighty two, eighty three. But in uh, in the eighties, in not in, in Notre Dame, there was a. This was the time of of uh, a growing movement to uh, for solidarity with Black South Africa and to end apartheid, and. The U.S. movement. I mean, the the anti-apartheid movement in England, in England actually was there was actually an international connection between various anti-apartheid groups. England anti-apartheid. My dad was closely involved. 
something called Trans Africa was founded in America by Randall Robinson. But this movement developed in an amazing movement, which brought a lot of people into politics. In Notre Dame, it was a little bit low key. Uh, there was a fellow called, friend called Peter Walsh from Zimbabwean or Rhodesian South African background, professor of politics. And we initiated this attempt to get Notre Dame, where I work, to divest. I mean, very early on, very early on, Columbia divested many, but Notre Dame resisted. So we simply, it was very low key. We had, and it also was very, Notre Dame was a Catholic university. It was very, very Catholic. It wasn't to my taste so much, but it was very Catholic prayer meetings on the, on the steps of the administration building every week. Uh, we had uh, meetings, debates, uh, a priest, South African priest called Bias Nordi, who was close to the ANC, came and spent half a year in Notre Dame. He got an honorary degree, outdoor masses. And, uh, but, but uh, Notre Dame never actually divested until the very end. Uh, and there was a, there was a, there was, there was a, there was a priest, a father, Oliver Williams, who was very connected with a whole constructive engagement, you know, in South Africa, in this in this period, Reagan was completely behind the apartheid regime, absolutely behind, and they had this policy of construct so called constructive engagement, and one of the priests in Notre Dame was involved in this constructive engagement. He was, he was actually a professor of business ethics, which I always thought was a bit of a dodgy subject. Is it still going around business ethics anyway? He was uh, Oliver Williams. We had debates about this. And uh, my my father came middle eighties and gave various talks to people and there were debates and things, but they never divested. And probably under the influence of Father Hesburgh, who had a reputation. Father Hesburgh was a, was the president of Notre Dame until around he retired eighty six. He had a reputation for being on the of being of being progressive because of being because of being connected with the civil rights movement, but in fact was very much against this divestment movement. Okay, so, so nothing nothing really happened there, but I think it brought a lot of people into politics. It was a bit on the Catholic side, but many young people came into politics in, in, in that university because of this movement. Uh, and of course, in US as a whole, it was a major thing with many people getting arrested. And, and I, I just want to say that, that the, a couple of more things, that the, in the US as a whole, the anti-apartheid movement, and it, again, it was about people being just aware of the hypocrisy and double standards of the American government in regard to South Africa, which was an openly racist society, <laughs> openly, in a sense like Israel is now. And, uh, and, the, and, uh, and, and, and the black Americans played a major, major role. So first of all, this divestment movement in America did play a role in the downfall of apartheid. It did play a role. It wasn't right. It, it, there was a armed struggle of some kind, but it was a bit low key. And it, I think, the international solidarity movement and divestment played a big role. The black, black America was, was fundamental in this whole, in this whole move, uh, through two things: the black congressional caucus. There was a fellow called Ron Dellums, congressman. Where was he from, the congressman? Do you know, Carl? Yes, Berkeley, California. Yeah, so Ron Dellums. And there's also an American version of anti-apartheid movement called Trans-Africa, run by Randall Robinson, who died last year. And together, I mean, so Black America, all I'm saying was fundamental in this whole in this whole solidarity movement, okay, for obvious reasons. And uh, the Anti-Apartheid Act was pushed by Trans-Africa and, this is 86 Anti-Apartheid Act, by the Congressional Black Caucus, as well as the Trans-Africa, against the wishes, against, right, against the wishes of, of Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan was like an instinctive racist, like Trump, I mean, without even thinking about it, just instinct. And he was automatically on the, on the side of the on the side of apartheid. Against his wishes, they passed the Anti-Apartheid Act. 
The Anti-Apartheid Act was subverted by Reagan a little bit, but somehow when when the first Bush came in, he actually he actually implemented implemented the Anti-Apartheid Act. Short-term loans were called in around 89. And as far as I understand from various sources, this was instrumental in the apartheid regime saying we have to we have to negotiate. Okay. So that's a little bit what I want to say. Uh, what else do I want to say here? Uh, what else do I want to say? Uh, let me see what else. I'm yeah, I, maybe this comes into, into, into later discussions. But all these, maybe we can discuss this later. Do I have a couple of minutes more, Michael? Yeah. So this is part of the questions that that you set you circulated about international impact, and also also uh, Carl touched on this in terms of what was going on in uh, France and things. But this, but this anti, especially the anti-Vietnam War activity, had had major international impact in in politicizing people in the United States, young people. In Germany, in West Germany, denazification didn't place, take place in the 1950s. It started taking place in the 1960s, connected with the student movement, which there was a German SDS. I don't know what did it stand for. I don't forget what it stand what it stood for. With, with Socialist Deutsche Studentenbund. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you, Carl. So. Uh, yeah, so denazification had not taken place in the 1950s. It began to take place in the 1960s in West Germany. East Germany was, was, was by, defini by definition denazified because the communists were in control. It took over. And uh, in France, you had this, this almost a revolution in France in 68. Uh, you know, so... and. <laughs> So, so this was a worldwide, a world, and the same thing in, like in, in, in the case of sort of the, in the case of the, for example, the British anti-apartheid movement, which was my parents helped founded. This was actually a major English or UK political organization, and lots of people came into it, and lots of people got into politics through that. So it was actually. It was a solidarity book, but it was also a, a homegrown British institute, British political organization. And many people entered politics through the anti-apartheid movement, including people who became a little bit on the right, like Gordon Brown, the prime minister after Blair. He entered politics as a student in Scotland in the anti-apartheid movement. So it was a it had a major effect on on English politics. So so this movement, at least the previous ones, anti-apartheid movement, Vietnam, anti-Vietnam war, there were horrible things happening. There was a, a, an attempt to, to bomb Vietnam back to the Stone Age, but these were, but the solidarity movements had worldwide significance. Okay, and I don't know. I, I hope similar things will happen with the with the Israel with the with the uh, solidarity with the Palestinian movement. So it was, uh, yeah. That's that's what I want to say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Anand. All right, Nat, you're up. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna start first kind of with my time in YDSA and then transition to Tahrir, um, because that helps also lay the context for how um Tahrir as a coalition was formed after October seventh. Um, so I joined my YDSA chapter, um, in fall of 2021, um, and then by January of that year, we had decided that we were going all in on a Fight for 15 campaign. Um, originally the chapter was a Students for Bernie group that then became chartered as YDSA, um, and so this was like the first big campaign that um, the chapter was taking on, um, especially right after COVID. This was the year right back to normalcy on campus. Um, and so that was our first big successful 
campaign um, and also more so my introduction, um, not just to the world of DSA, but also interacting with campus administrations um, and specifically at the University of Michigan, kind of the dialectic of being a public institution with elected leaders, but these leaders are um, pretty favorable to certain donors, and stuff like that. Um, and so that was my freshman year. Um, and then shortly after that, um, coming to my sophomore year, um, our grad union was bargaining for a new contract. Um, and so that was kind of the big campaign of the year for our chapter was leading the undergraduate solidarity um, with GEO um, on campus during their strike. Um, and then alongside that, we also set out the intention to really um, build a stronger relationship with our SJP chapter on campus. Um, University of Michigan has very, very strong history of activism um, where SDS was founded, Weathermen. Um, we really also have like looked back to the Black Action Movement on campus, as well as the anti-apartheid movement that happened um, within the broader Ann Arbor community as well as campus. Um, <clears throat> and so, but our SJP chapter um, also called Students Allied for Freedom and Equality or SAFE, I'm probably gonna refer to them as SAFE for most of us because it's what we call them on campus. Um, but they've actually existed since around 2003, I believe, is the year that they were founded. Um, and almost every year since they were founded, they have agitated through student government and passed a BDS resolution. Um, and so Palestinian, specifically, BDS organizing also has a really strong history on campus. And we're like, as a DSA chapter in Michigan with a very strong Arab American population, um, like we want to build a stronger relationship with our SJP chapter. Um, and so through both that relationship building as well as working with our grad union on campus, we were able to learn a lot of really important organizing skills and more kind of put the technical parts of organizing to practice. Um, it also kind of kick-started our own um, undergraduate union push, our um, resident advisors actually within the last couple weeks officially became unionized. Um, but more importantly, that helped us really connect the militant parts of labor to more the militant activism that's going on on campus. Um, so then come uh, past year, come October 7th, um, basically, Within 24 hours by October 8th, um, our YDSA chapter as well as grad union are some of the first organizations that safe contacts to be like, hey, we're gonna be out in the diet protesting, um, please join us. And so we were immediately there, um, actually a, um, I believe it was earlier that week, I would have to literally look at the calendar, my brain gets a bit fuzzy around the time with how things fast, how fast things were moving. Um, but SAFE annually holds a um, apartheid wall demonstration. And YDSA and GEO were two orgs that were present standing in their kind of new ally line. Um, and so overall, the political environment on campus was becoming more agitational, um, much more confrontational, with the administration um, as well as specifically political. Um, our grad union, um, a lot of the core organizers also have gone to labor notes trainings, labor notes conference itself. Um, some of them have been in DSA, are in DSA slash YDSA. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> to get back to where I was at, um, kind of, in this moment of initial crisis, um, we, um, being YDSA along with GEO and SAFE, we're like, we need to kind of just open it up to anyone who wants to get together is able to help and do action. Um, so that was the beginning of the 
Tahrir coalition, um, roughly translating to liberation um, from Arabic to English um, doesn't do it justice. Um, there's more of like a liberation spirit aspect to the word. Um, I'm not the best person to explain it, unfortunately, but I think there's also kind of some beauty in the name that we chose and for what it represents. Um, but we've slowly assembled from roughly, I believe, 10 orgs um, with GEO and YDSA initially being the only two um, explicitly political non-affinity orgs to um, close to 100 orgs signed into the coalition now. Um, and so kind of for a timeline of our year, um, we were doing general protests um, from October to roughly the start of November. Um, and through this time, our first step is to pass another um, student government resolution on um, BDS. And so we do that. Um, it Our central student government refuses to actually vote on it and pass it on to the larger student body. Um, and then actually APAC came swinging in um, with about $50,000 um, into a student government election. Um, they were texting alumni, asking alumni to vote. They were flying planes around campus um, and ultimately pressured admin to cancel the election as a whole. Um, and so after that, um, there was massive protests specifically on November 17th. Um, I, as well as about 20 others, participated in a sit-in at the president's office um, while the rest of our protest group kind of marched into the administration building. Um, but that turned a um, bit chaotic. Um, and actually, um, I and the rest of the sit-in group, as well as some people that were downstairs, then um, had pending felony charges. Um, most of those were dropped until then there were four that were being moved through and now those have been moved down to misdemeanors after um, very, very hard campaigning. Um, but that actually kind of leads into part of the like mind games that our administration has been playing with us. Um, they actually waited to announce that they were charging us until the very last day of the winter semester. Um, and this is like after we have done finals. So literally the semester is done and grades have to be in the next day. Like we're leaving for the winter winter. Um, <clears throat> and so they pushed it off um, and we were relentlessly campaigning against the prosecutor um, to get those charges reduced, which thankfully they now have. Um, kind of really, really fast forward um, for time's sake. Um, we did launch an encampment. We actually um, were planning on doing it to kick off the uh, year <laughs> this semester, but um, Columbia popped theirs up and we're like, fuck it, we'll join in. Um, <laughs> we had the ability to. So um, that actually stayed up through the end of the semester. Um, I got to celebrate my birthday at the encampment, which was really, really nice. I enjoyed it. Um, and through that time, I um, was on kind of comms for it, as well as I was on jail support um, the day after my birthday when our encampment was cleared um, by DPSS. Um, and so that was very intense to go through um to talk first about the encampment itself since i have some time um we really took um our whole whole point through this um our initial campaign kind of divest don't arrest um but we're now shifting to and really emphasizing divest but then reinvest in your campus reinvest in your community um if the University of Michigan is a public university, not just the largest employer within the city of Ann Arbor, but also one of the largest employers within the state of Michigan in general. Um, it is an economic 
powerhouse within this state, as well as kind of academia at large when it comes to the more public side of things. Um, but um, like we're, we really wanted to serve the community with our encampment. Um, and so part of, I think, what made our encampment so strong compared to other universities um, and something that the literal setup and structure of Umich Ann Arbor compared to, say, Columbia being gated off um, was that it was a lot easier to be open to the community around us. Um, we welcomed in some unhoused comrades from um, the kind of larger Ann Arbor area, as well as Ypsilanti. Um, we had like a true 24-7 staff, um, food and medical tent. Um, so it really became a home for a lot of people um, during that time. And um, during our encampment, we really learned and I think took it to heart within the coalition. Um, and it's shown up through planning conversations that we're not going through into the semester that while we are centering Palestinian liberation, we also really, um, I was about to use the name of this panel for a second, but <laughs> we we want to re-democratize the university um, and kind of not, e not even restore because it never actually existed, um, but build a democratic public institution um, within our encampment. From day one, we were having near constant um, programming ranging from political education, um, doing uh, tattoos. Um, there were a couple um, like dabke dances. Um, so just taking all of that to heart within the encampment and more leaning into the joyful side of liberation and learning what it means to build an alternative radical community um, came from that period of time. But then also it was clear during a sunrise prayer service um, that people were having. Um, and so I um, I was, since I was on comms and I'll kind of wrap up here, um, the morning that it was cleared, I was on comms. So I was staying home and kind of immediately posting some of the videos that I was sent as well as working on jail support. Um, and so it's kind of contextualized where we are now. Um, our regents, I believe that it was more called in as a favor because Ellie Savitt was refusing to press charges relating to clearing the encampment. Um, but our more democratic regents have called in Dana Nessel um, to presumably press charges against um, some comrades, including a YDSA member. Um, and then also as of couple hours ago, um, a specifically YDSA member as well as um, some other comrades were fired and barred from being rehired at the university for breaking code of conduct um, when technically within all the rules, they didn't actually break anything. They're just being punished. So um, going into this year, um, facing a lot of repression, but also um, really have learned a lot through this last year and looking back to history for what we want to be able to accomplish alongside divestment. Awesome. Thank you for that. And, you know, uh, thank you, for, you know, to all our, we're not finishing, we're not wrapping up right now, but, you know, thank you to everyone for, you know, all you've done, you know, and uh, for our older comrades, all you've done throughout the years. Um, it, it can be, you know, people put a lot on the line for this and uh you know as now you just said and uh you know what we do has real material consequences um so i kind of want uh our panelists to feel free to engage with what each other has said um if you need some time i can always uh you know throw out a question um and it kind of tails with what nat ended on which is looking back what do you think you would have done differently or what what do you think you know were you know you wish you had done knowing with foresight so i don't know if anyone wants to jump in and also um everyone in uh that's watching feel free to add questions now and we'll be getting to those soon um so uh, does anyone want to take that up or anyone have any of the panelists have uh you know 
thoughts about what other panelists said? I, I could say something, but I'd rather I'd rather somebody else starts. Um, uh, how much of your campus work at uh, Ann Arbor uh, around Dallas Island do you take out to the local community uh, in Ann Arbor? You know, the, you know, not the people necessarily associated with the university, but do you do, you know, say with the general electorate? Do you take the question out and try to engage their ideas? Yeah, um, you're kind of breaking up, but I think I heard the gist of your question. Um, we're actually, that was um, something that came from our conversations is how do we want to relate to the larger community, especially more people across Michigan? Um, and it kind of works out because our regents of the university who are kind of like the decision maker panel, they're the ones that when divestment happens, they're signing off on it. Um, they're democratically elected um, in this year. It's an election year for one of the regents. So we actually kind of worked with some uncommitted organizers um, through more like community um, connections from Dearborn than anything else um, to kind of recruit um, Hueda to run for region. Um, and so our um, state democratic convention is Saturday. So pending things going well Saturday and she ends up on the ballot. Um, we really plan on being able to gear more community engagement um, towards electing her um, and applying pressure um, that way on the regions. Um, but um, kind of in another way is um, kind of, we're, we're figuring out more targeting things to do, but on a conceptual level, um, we try to hold and we decided we're going into this next year, like really putting forward transparency, democracy, and like having mass meetings that people can always show up to. Um, we're kicking off the start of the year this Sunday with a legal defense mass meeting for a total update on what our coalition legal kind of organizing status is, as well as um, where people can be looped in at. Um, <clears throat> and then we're also um, actually through some democratic organizing on behalf of YDSA and GEO, as mentioned earlier, um, have been passing some like internal resolutions almost. Um, and one of those includes creating a form of a membership committee um, to also create what we're calling like a Tahrir Solidarity Network um, to really bring in community organizing um, beyond Ann Arbor and Ipsy, but also to the um, two other campuses within Dearborn and Flint. Um, so SJP chapters were established um, on both of those campuses over the summer. So we're going to be able to do a lot more coordinated action across the three city campuses as well. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, Anand, did you have something you want to say? Because uh, we have questions. Uh... No, I, I, saw, I, I saw a question from Donovan about how how 68 experience can maybe inform mm -hmm. current current uh, current various there there are various activities anti trump blm diverse things how and to be honest i have got to think about it maybe maybe carl or nat could or carl could answer this uh, in a in a you know in a, in, a, in a coherent way but i i've got to think about it to be honest but i i want to say something that you know that there's this in terms of doing things differently, there's there is there are a, a, a close kind of analogies between between the the Viet, anti Vietnam War stuff, between anti apartheid, and between the current movement. Is that is the predominantly young people simply see directly the hypocrisy and double standards of the government or mainstream whatever. And uh, in Vietnam, you know, talking about democracy, but then trying to bomb a country to 
the Stone Age in apartheid, a complete support of the of 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 absolute of of official racism, and uh, the same thing in Israel when you know with just clear. In fact, we had a rally. I I didn't say something anything about the Notre Dame movement. There's there is a strong movement in Notre Dame, both in the town South Bend and. Uh, and there were several rallies and things. Seventeen people were arrested, but there was one little rally on the just outside Notre Dame, outside the gates, because they banned inside inside demonstrations. This is in May. One of my former, one of my old colleagues from the old days. I was I was there since the eighties, who I played soccer with. Just came up to me and said, gave me a hug and said, "It's obvious. It's obvious at the moral level. It's obvious, you know." And what's going on? It's obvious what position to take. It's an obvious moral decision, an obvious moral choice. And this obviousness somehow of a moral choice, one imagines sometimes that in the current thing environment that younger people are somehow that, that the whole social media stuff as the whole domination of capitalism has has kind of has 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 distorted people's moral choices. But you see that it's just it's still there. And it's really heartening to see that young people still have this fundamental ability to make the right choice, you know. And this is one analogy between all three situations. One little difference, a slight difference, is that in the in the case of the of the anti-Vietnam War and the anti-apartheid movement, this was this took place in the in the context where there where there was still a kind of socialist bloc in the world. At least nominally socialist bloc, Soviet Union nominally socialist, and uh, and it was possible for people on the left to, as Carl said, to simply support the National Liberation Front, which I did. Support, you, know, you you argue for the for the defeat of the U.S. Easy, easy, on the left. Same thing in now South Africa. The ANC was actually a, was actually a social democratic a social democratic kind of organization, but with le, like the, the Freedom Charter, which was abandoned actually in the nineties, was a more or less a socialist social democratic thing. Communist Party was very influential, but it was easy to to support the ANC. It was totally unproblematic to support the ANC. At the current time, when the left is being dis, is dispersed. It's, I think, a little bit more problematic about, you know, I mean, personally, I, I personally think that to the popular front, the PFLP at some point made a statement 10 years ago that the Hamas is, is part of the resistance, which I agree with. But I think, you know, one should be wary. One has to be, especially in, in the Iranian case, when many, many people in the, Ira in the when the Iranian revolution took place in 1979, the Iranian Communist Party put supported more or less the you know the islamic islamists and the islamists and and they and they just simply annihilated the, the, the young leftists they killed everybody people i knew in london in the 70s young iranian leftists went back to iran after, and they were annihilated you know destroyed and so so the whole is, this whole issue of solidarity unconditional solidarity is in, is 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 more problematic now than it used to be Another issue in terms of another sorry to talk so much. Another issue is that in the old days, in those in that in that period of the of the of this socialist bloc, and there was a belief that you know that that this national liberation movements were simply part of a progressive socialist movement. You know, there was a belief that this is all part of the international movement towards socialism. And it was a it was a bit of a hoax. <laughs> it wasn't true, you know. It just wasn't. There was even a belief that stupid things like in Zimbabwe, you had ZAPU was was connected with Soviet Union, ZANU with China, and people thought, okay, the ZANU is revolutionary because it's connected with China. But this was Mugabe. It was complete nonsense. So this this kind of there was a certain hopes going on, in my opinion, with the whole national liberation. Although in principle it was correct, but what actually happened was quite different. So those are things that I would I somewhat I somewhat regret. I was a little bit of a of a third worldist, Maoist in those days, and I'm a little bit. I you know I think one should have thought be more. Maybe if socialism hadn't collapsed, it would it, it would have been different. But so those those are some of the 
thoughts about what you did differently, how the past and the and the and, and the past and the present connect with each other. So we're in a bit of a different world, but nevertheless, there's an oppressed and an oppressor, and we should support the oppressed. I I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, I was smiling because I remembered all the old debates and back and forth about supporting this one and supporting that one and back and forth. I will say one thing I think is very important that we learned from this period that can be passed down. Uh, we learned that there are basically all the politics of our time in that time and even our time fall into one of two baskets. Mm. Politics as self-expression and politics as strategy. And for the large part of our time, as a youth movement, we were in the camp of politics as self-expression, not so much politics as a strategy. I don't, I don't know what self-expression means, Carl. Well, for instance, when you're making solidarity around Gaza, what's the point of uh, wearing kafias? and waving Palestinian flags and chanting Hamas slogans. Is that what the people in Gaza really need right now? Is it what they need most right now? I don't think so. I think what the people in Gaza need most right now is an immediate ceasefire. And, and then... Uh, support coming in relief, humanitarian relief to the people of Gaza. That's what's needed most. That's the pressure that has to be made most. And that has to be your main objective to try to concentrate the greatest number of forces upon our ruling class to get an immediate ceasefire all this debate back and forth and waving, you know, that's all mine. I mean, we did that too. We carried our NLF flags to the different demonstrations and, and so on and so forth. Here's the way I would sum it up. We just designated two forces, the critical force and the main force. The critical force was when young people rose up and held up a mirror to society a moral mirror, and says, is this what you want to become? Is this the kind of society you want to be? That's what the young students sitting in the lunch counters in the segregated South were doing. They were acting as a critical force that aroused a militant minority to rise up and expand their ranks and numbers. But when all is said and done, the critical force is not yet the main force. The main force, politics, begins with millions. The main force is the broad masses of the working class and other democratically minded people in the country who are not yet awakened. So the key question then, it's not how do we just continue being a, mil uh, a militant critical force. The key question is how to connect the critical force with the main force. That's the key transition that has to be made. That's what is needed most. You can wear your kafias if you want and fly flags if you want, you know. I had a conversation once with uh, Hanan Hashawi, who's a leading Palestinian member of the PLO. And uh, we were going, I went over with her, the, the groups I like most, the Democratic Popular Front and the Popular Front and back and forth on them. And we both laughed. She said, you know, Carl, she said, I agree with you. I like, I like one, you know, and we named the different groups we liked. She said, but only 5% of the people in the country 
of Israel, Palestine, agree with us. The vast majority don't. We are in a minority of 5%. So with all my decisions about who to support and this and that, you know, along with $2.50, it would give me a pass on the New York City subway. So the most important thing is how do we get the ceasefire? How do we stop the killing? That's the most important thing. If you want to wear your kaffiya, I, I, I have one. I wear it in winter all the time. It's a wonderful scarf. But it's not my self-expression. My self-expression, as I go to my local congressman and get my local uh, peace group here in Beaver County, and we organize programs around immediate ceasefire. We bring in people from Gaza to speak on the need for an immediate ceasefire, and we pressure our congressman, that this is what we need. And if you want to get reelected, you better pay attention to us. Yeah. So that's part of the point that has to be made. There's, there's the politics as self-expression and politics as strategy. I'd like to. You need them both at different times, but you have to know when. I'd like to get back to that, but I want to let uh, Nat speak yeah um i was just gonna answer the um question from rod in the chat um i'll just read it out real quick um <clears throat> so many campus bds victories have been won with unity from diverse student clubs or organizations coming together so that your experience at ann arbor what role did the arab and muslim student community play um, so I'm actually going to drop the link to our website in the chat, um, created by coalition members, our comp site members coded it all and maintain it. Um, but you can see under the about page, um, the hundred organizations, it's in alphabetical order now, uh, no longer a signatory order, unfortunately, no more YDSA flex. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um really like this our our power on campus would not be possible without the both diversity of tactics that we have employed so far as well as the diversity of organizations and i would say more than anything like organizers and thought that kind of exists within the coalition um definitely like things were different um in November um, compared to today, um, there's definitely been like a lot of political development of the newer organizers, a lot of kind of grounding within our material reality and less kind of out there ideology based politics, um, which has become useful. But something that we've kind of always maintained and held on to is doing our best to center and uplift um, the Arab and Muslim students within the coalition and specifically our um, Palestinian comrades. Um, and we have had a lot of like in-depth kind of conversations, um, both reflective and um, kind of how do we want to move forward um, with like, what does it mean for us to be an intersectional coalition that is able to center voices at the same time as saying the genocide in Gaza is connected to Cop City, is connected to DPSS on our campus. Um, and kind of building those things, building those connections. Um, and so I hope that semi answers your question. Um, yeah. And then also, um, wanted to touch on what I saw about the um, opinion polls supporting ceasefire and restricting aid to Israel but being unfavorable um, to campus protests. Um, I think that one really, really defining thing, um, and I'm probably a bit biased because this is what I'm studying um, in like university um, and researching, but um, kind of the way that the media has worked in cozying up to capital um, 
the grounds that we are fighting on today is not the same as the anti-apartheid anti movement, anti-war movement um, in the 60s and 70s. There wasn't an organization pushing $50,000 into a student government election in the 60s and 70s, but there was like last year. Um, and so I think that part of it is the material realities around organizing and specifically BDS organizing as a result of targeted intensive development on behalf of Israel and specifically the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, like developing programs after 2016 with the express purpose of stopping BDS on campus um, because they know it works. And so those preventative measures, for lack of a better word, I think are really showing up in more of the social environment around protests on campus um, that doesn't really exist in other places and hasn't existed historically. Just, just no. one thing. Oh, yeah, go for it. Thanks, Nat. I think you made a very good point about about the about the powerful Israeli, you know, Israeli uh, activity. With did you say Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Is that what you said? Yeah, I'll actually give me one minute and I'll drop it in the chat for everyone. Okay, okay, but you know, so, but I got, I'm, I'm going to say that in the in the anti party in the anti party stuff, South Africa's the South African security boss bureau of bureau of what the the special the special security police. They were actually killing. <laughs> they were blowing up people, you know, in uh, in outside outside of South Africa. I mean, the anti-apartheid movement office, ANC office, was blown up. Was 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 attacked. There was my dad was scared of being blown up every minute. There were there were these comrades. I mean, there were these. There was uh, Ruth first was blown up in uh, in Mozambique. <laughs> You know, so outside South Africa, they were doing it. So it wasn't. So there were also there was there were things, and and they were also pretty active, and 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 they had the complete support of the, the the, the South African regime had the total support of the of the U.S. and of Reagan and Thatcher. So, but you're right that there's a really a major attempt now by Israel to, to interfere with you know, with the movement. But 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 there were parts. There were aspects of this also present in the past. You know. That's all I want to say at that, but 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 I agree I agree with you <laughs> broadly. Yeah, I think more to kind of directly respond a bit real quick, like the the time that has gone on and really the consolidation of capital, um, like looking at it through an explicitly like socialist lens to understand like why the terrain is different now. Mm. Yeah. So I, I kind of, in the last few minutes, want to kind of touch on something that Carl said. And uh, Nat, first off, thank you for dropping all those links into the chat. Uh, so it's a little bonus for people that showed up. Um, uh, so in your experience with doing the grad um, union organizing and um, working with folks on and off campus, do you think that that has affected how you approach talking with people kind of so if i understand kind of carl's point about you know politics of self-expression i think when you have to work with you know let's say folks outside of the left milieu right like we'll, we'll call them normies or whatever the general public um you know stuff that like you're doing when you're doing labor work and i mean i know grad students maybe a little bit more self-selected but you know when you're working with the community broadly has you found that that has affected the way you and the coalition had presented yourself and how you go about with like talking points and stuff along those lines. Yeah. Um, we really kind of taken to heart, like meet people where they're at, um, both like intellectually, like uh, where they're at politically, but also um, inherently, like, people are going to be interested in things that relate to them. Um, and so initially, um, and also to kind of speak almost a little bit, like, 
the development I've seen of organizers within Tucker going from kind of the idea of politics as expression versus politics as strategy. Um, Sometimes, like, in my opinion, like, you do have to meet people where they're at, where they're seeing politics as wearing a badge for something. Um, And you kind of have to take time and kind of nurture in and provide those talking points of like, here's how Palestine actually directly impacts you. Um, And I mean, it's, it's different going from like the affinity groups at Michigan. Um, Like we've um, been doing a lot of kind of intensive work, um, both on like a political education level, as well as relationship building level um, with kind of the Black Student Union um, and kind of building on the connection between Palestinian liberation, Black liberation, as well as policing and abolition um, within the United States, as well as kind of the local abolition movement um, that we have going on. Um, so yeah, sorry to kind of trail off. I feel like I don't have like a clean answer, unfortunately, but. No, it's all, it's off the cuff. So I totally understand. I, I will say from my experience organizing protests, not on campus, but, um, in my weird suburban, like moderate area that I, I think the politics of expression become more complicated because I definitely feel, feel that, um, because there's not a huge left presence. There's really not really a left presence outside of the DSA and, you know, a few dozen other random folks in a big area. Um, but I think that sometimes, you know, like we're in uh, the Kafia or other stuff, I think that some it's important that we do express solidarity because I think it also gives permission to other people to, you know, express solidarity and realize, oh, there's other people like that. Um, but to Carl's point, I know, you know, we started this off with the video from Fred Hampton who talked about kind of the use of, um, uh, you know, African attire as this way of presenting a radicalism that ended up not being radical whatsoever, where you just did it as a parents. I would say people that you know, are wearing the kafia today are probably not the same, uh, you know, not taking a liberal approach. You know, they're the people who are actually engaged in radical action. You know, if you're engaged with the protests um, on campus, if you're willing to be arrested, if you're willing to, you know, be fired for your beliefs, I think that that's different. It's different than if like Nancy Pelosi decided to wear the kafia, right? <laughs> like, I think that that's where the politics as expression can be, you know, really troubling but um yeah i don't so where it's 9 23 i don't know if anyone has wrap uh thoughts to wrap up this conversation or final closing thoughts before we let everyone go and listen to kamala harris's uh speech i just want to say it's been really a pleasure to listen to both carl and nat talking about their experiences and I, you know in the past i did you know it's been really a pleasure to well, it's been interesting to hear this so i have uh, th- thank you I, I have one short story i can tell you about anti-apartheid in uh, early on i was out at the university of nebraska in uh, 1966 and uh, we decided in the anniversary of sharpville to do a uh, anti-apartheid action and nobody there had ever heard about it so we uh, got a microphone in the student union and began to talk about it. So, But I decided, okay, let's build a broad coalition, anti-apartheid. Let's, how about uh, uh, I go talk to the Cornhuskers? Cornhuskers are big. That's a football team. They've got African-American members. So I go off and I talk to the black members of the University of Nebraska football team. The black, And so they were right on good. So once I got to Cornhuskers, uh, to agree to, to come to the demonstration. So then I went around to all the fraternities, and none of them had ever thought much about it, but I said, well, we're going to oppose apartheid. We're going to march around to all the banks in the, in the downtown Lincoln, Nebraska, 
and give them a piece of our mind about funding apartheid. And so we want the, your fraternities and sororities to join us and, and the Hornhuskers football team to do it too. So it actually came out very well. We made the front page of the Lincoln papers and the Omaha papers and the and the black guys from the from the Cornhuskers football team joined us and we had a very good uh, anti-apartheid action. Of course, it, this was early on there. The whole big movement didn't start till much later, but I thought you might appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But yeah, you have to get outside your comfort zone. Yeah, if exactly. you're in your comfort zone, you're not doing it right. Yeah, you're talk you're right. Exactly. And Nat, do you wanna finish it up? Yeah. Um kind of go back. This was like the very, very first question that was answered, and I answered the second part of it by sending a link. So it got buried in the like Zoom thing, I think. Um <clears throat> but from Donovan, um, what text would you recommend from earlier st student movements to current students today. Um, this isn't so much text specific um, as much as I would recommend like reading about the local history and just movements within your region um, as much as possible um, and kind of relating that history to present day power mapping. Um, like being able to have like decades of literal receipts of like here's how like the people in power have responded to apartheid and genocide in the past um contrasting to how they are responding today um in addition to a level of um, brutalization of students and protesters um is kind of valuable both on a organizing standpoint to loop people in as well as and I mean we just talked about this in a meeting before this that I was in um but from a calm standpoint of really kind of presenting the contradictions that are existing within present society um and I think it was Carl that said it but like being the students that are holding up that mirror and being like this is what you are actively choosing as you say that you want to do this thing right. I put a, a, I have gathered a collection of all what I consider the best lost writings of the 60s uh, under the title Revolutionary Youth in the New Working Class. And, and it's edited by me. I put the title of it in the chat. So if anybody wants to gather all the direct source materials that we had that have been otherwise lost, uh, I managed to rescue them all from the memory hole. No, that's awesome. Thank you for doing that work, uh, Carl. Not thank you for the suggestions, um, and thank you all, all the panelists, so much. Uh, again, you know, thank you for the work you've done throughout the years. Thank you for the work you continue to do. Um, you know, everyone appreciates it, um, and thank you for coming here tonight and talking. Um, I was obviously joking about going and watching the Kamala Harris thing. You should instead join I'm, my DSA. I'm, I'm right, <laughs> right on it. <laughs> join Wouldn't my miss DSA. It for the world. Join DSA <laughs> if you if you haven't. Uh, you know, we need every person. You know, unfortunately, it looks like uh, you know the struggle is going to continue for a long time. Um, uh, you know, so you know we need to continue to fight. Um, so. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Have a great night. Again, thank you so much, panelists. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Peace. See you.